Hello friend, welcome back. We will start today with the next topic that is a prime photometry. The learning outcome of this topic, the learner will be able to explain the principle of flame photometry, discuss instrumentation and component of a flame photometer, relate the interference produced in flame photometry and describe application of flame photometry. Atomic spectroscopy is thought to be the oldest instrumental method for determination of the element. This technique was introduced in the mid 19th century during which Bunsen and Khrushchev showed that the radiation emitted from flame depends upon characteristic element present in the flame. The potential of atomic spectroscopy in both qualitative as well as quantitative analysis were then well established. The development in the instrumentation area leads to the widespread application of atomic spectroscopy. Atomic spectroscopy is an unavoidable tool in the field of analytical chemistry. It is divided in three types which are absorption spectroscopy, emission spectroscopy, illumination spectroscopy. The different branches of atomic spectroscopy are flame photometry or flame atomic emission spectroscopy in which the species is examined in the form of atom. The another one, the second one is atomic absorption spectroscopy or it is called as AAS and the latest technique is inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy it is called as a ICP AES. So as per our syllabus we are going to see these two topic flame photometry and atomic absorption spectroscopy. Introduction to the flame photometry. Flame photometry or it is more accurately called as a flame atomic emission spectroscopy is a branch of spectroscopy in which the species is examined in spectrophotometer are in the form of atoms. It is initially converted to the atom, then they are excited, they will going to the highest energy level, coming back to the ground state. While coming back to the ground state, they remit back the energies in the term of radiations and they are studied. It is used to determine the concentration of alkali, that is group 1, and alkali earth metal, that is group 2, in various samples. A photoelectric flame photometer is an instrument used in inorganic chemical analysis to determine concentration of certain metal ions among them sodium, potassium, calcium and lithium are common. Time photometry is based on measurement of intensity of the light emitted when metal is introduced into the flame. The wavelength of color tells what element is it can be used for the qualitative analysis to know the type of metal which is there in the sample. Similarly, the color intensity tells us how much of the element is present. So it is also used for the quantitative analysis. The basic principle upon which atomic spectroscopy is based on the fact that matter absorbs light at the same wavelength at which emits the light. Liquid sample containing metal salt solution is introduced into the flame. Solvent is first vaporized leaving particle of solid salt which is then vaporized into the gaseous state. Gaseous molecule dissociate to give the natural neutral atoms which can be excited. So uh, you think that the thermal emission is the uh, basis of your flame photometry. In case of atomic absorption spectroscopy, they are unexcited atoms. Here we are using the excited atoms and excitation is done by the thermal energy of the flame. The unstable excited atoms emit photons while returning to the lower energy state. The measurement of the emitted photon on the basis of a flame photometry. Under constant and controlled conditions, the light intensity of characteristic wavelength produced by each of the atom is directly proportional to 
the number of atoms that are emitting the energies, which in turn is directly proportional to the concentration of substance of interest in the sample. So what are the various steps involved? So when we are doing the flame photometry, the sample solution is sprayed or aspired as a fine mist into the flame. It is converted to the small droplet that is called as the aspired nebulization. Conversion of sample solution into the aerosol by atomizer. Okay, atomizer that is not automatic. Atomizer that is sent uh, converting into the form of a small spray, uh, spray or droplet. So in this case, there is no chemical change in sample is taking place. Only the sample is converted into the fine mist. Heat of the flame vaporizes sample constituents that it will vaporize all your solvent still there is no chemical change that solvent vaporizes leaving solid particles of the salt in the flame. By heat of the flame and the action of the reducing gases that is fuel, molecules and ions of sample species are decomposed and reduced to give the atoms. Here the actual um, ionizations will take place, they will be converted to the atoms. Sodium is converted by loss of electrons will be converted to the sodium atoms. Heat of the flame causes excitation of some atoms into the higher electronic state that is called as thermal excitation state. Excited atom revert to the ground state by emission of light energy of characteristic wavelength which is measured by the detector. So various metals emits a characteristic color light when heated. I will show you some metals which are generally determined by flame photometry. The wavelength of emission or wavelength of determination is important to know. First is your sodium which is uh, determined at 589 nanometers and it has a characteristic flame color of yellow. Similarly the second one is your potassium. It is having the wavelength of 766 nanometer and characteristic flame over color is violet. Barium that can be detected having the wavelength of 554 nanometer and uh, it gives the lime green color filament. Then calcium it is having the wavelength of 662 nanometer and it gives the orange color flame. And lithium that is detected at 670 nanometer giving the red color generally a comparison between the flame photometer and atomic absorption spectrophotometer is commonly asked. So flame emission technique or flame photometry it involves measuring the radiation emitted by excited atom that is related to the concentration. The flame emission intensity is con in contrast it depends upon the number of excited atoms is generally influenced by temperature variation. A controlled temperature conditions are required in the flame photometer. Whereas in the atomic absorption spectroscopy, atomic absorption is uh, it is a measuring radiation absorbed by unexcited atoms that are to be determined. Here are the excited atom and here are the unexcited atom. The atomic absorption depends upon only the number of unexcited atoms. Here they depends upon the number of excited atoms. The absorption intensity is not directly affected by temperature of the flame. Okay, so this is emission spectroscopy. This is absorption spectroscopy. First you can write these differences. Uh, now today uh, again we will start with the next part that is instrumentation. So flame photometer consists of falling component. It has a one pressure regulator, flow meters or fuel gases, the first component. Then flame source, second is atomizing devices um, where it will be converted to the small droplets. Then optical system that either the filters or monochrome matters. Then photosensitive detectors and a readout unit. So this is the flame photometer. It has a separate system for pressure regulation. So uh, here we are using the fuel gas fuel gas and that is simple cooking gas and uh, air as a supporting gas. So air is to be generated by this air generators. It has this uh, pressure regulators and control walls which will uh, control how much 
air is introduced then there is a knob which will control how much uh, fuel gas that is your cooking gas is introduced into the flame photometer which will adjust the intensity of the filament which is here then uh, you can see there is a small capillary here this capillary will suck the liquid inside and it will convert it to the droplets small droplets by the atomizing devices it has certain optical system here so it will uh, sense what color of light is there that is what is the wavelength of the light and then it is to be sent to the photo detector it will be converted to the certain digital display so it is having a simple instrumentation so this is the block diagram or schematic representation of the flame photometer you will see this burner nebulizer system here the capillary is deep into the solution it is aspiring the liquid it is sucking the liquid that liquid is coming out through these nozzles it will be converted to the small droplets and then they will get admixture with the fuel gas and oxidant okay so this oxidant that is your compressed air and fuel gas that is your lpg all these are admixture here in the premix chamber then they are coming out through this burner here it will get burned into the flame uh, it will produce a characteristic color which is then sensed by this optical system filters or monochromatas will be there then that will be sent to the photo detector and the signal produced is amplified now before you go to actual instrumentation you should learn what is the structure of a flame as seen in the figure the flame may be divided in the following regions or zone it has a preheated zone then this is called as a preheated zone then primary reaction zone or inner zone this is then this is the internal zone and secondary reaction zone the temperature at, at different zones varies depending upon the various zones of the flame the preheated zone in this combustion mixture is heated in ignition temperature by thermal condition from the primary reaction zone the primary reaction zone this zone is about 0.1 mm thick at the atmospheric pressure there is no thermodynamic equilibrium in this zone and the concentration of ions and free radical is very high this reason is not used for the flame photometric determination the third zone is a inter uh, interconal zone it can excite it up to the considerable height the maximum temperature is achieved just about the tip of the inner zone so um, uh, when we are doing the sealing process also so here also in the sealing process uh, you are holding your tubes at this zone so that you will get the maximum temperature so the color of this filament will also show you the different zones you should have the idea of this zone the next region is a secondary reaction zone in this zone the product of the combustion process are burned to stable molecule species by the surrounding air okay so this one secondary reaction zone so where actually the detector should be located and where the uh, flame uh, what should be the flame intensity that is to be learned so you should have the idea about the various zones which are there in a flame the optimum flame temperature depends upon the several factor as excitation energy of element so we are doing the thermal excitation so we should know what is the optimum temperature in the sensitivity of the measurement presence of the other elements also that is interference the temperature of flame generally lies between 1000 degree centigrade to 3000 degree centigrade different gases can be used to produce this flame temperatures so um, because we are doing the thermal excitation the control of your flame temperature is very important mixture of fuel gas and air do not use very hot flame because of presence of the nitrogen so we are generally using the air and coal gas that is known as the cooking gas okay so it is also called as a uh, cold flame because it is not too hot because it contains the nitrogen the cyanogen gas produces the excellent spectra but it is toxic and it is very difficult to handle this cyanogen gas 
Acetylene and hydrogens are most frequent choices, but your simple laboratory flame photometer uses the cooking gas. So I, use, I will show you the various uh, hydrocarbons which can be used uh, in the flame photometer. So we are using the ordinary cooking gas. It is giving the temperature of 1700 degree centigrade. We can also go for the acetylene flame. Acetylene flame, it will give the uh, 2000 to 2300 degree centigrade, which can be used for the detection of the lithium and magnesium by the flame photometric determination. Okay, so generally the methane gas uh, temperature in oxygen, it is 2700 and temperature is air. Uh, so methane is your fuel gas and these are the supporting combustion gases. Either we can use directly oxygen or we can use the air. So air uh, due to the presence of nitrogen, the temperature get reduces. Then in propane, it is 2800 and with air, it is 1925. In butane, it is 2900 uh, degree centigrade with oxygen and uh, with air it is 1010. Hydrogen, our cooking gas is an admixture. So it is admixture with the um, propane and butane giving 1700 degree centigrade and uh, it is to be admixed with air only. Hydrogen, it is having the temperature of 2780 with the oxygen but hydrogen oxygen combination is very explosive we cannot use hydrogen to be supported by using the oxygen okay so we need to be used it with the uh, air simple air can be used that will giving the maximum temperature of 2100 degree centigrade so acetylene is most commonly utilized acetylene oxygen admixture giving a temperature of 3050 and temperature in air that is having the temperature uh, temperature uh, temperature with air is 200 degrees centigrade so just <clears throat> pause the video and give me some example where you have seen the uses of this air uh, combinations of fuel gas and um, your oxygen or air pause the video write your experiences on paper if you have finished play the video yes okay so cooking gas generally we are using in the house okay so do you know it is an admixture of what we are not using oxygen admixture there okay in case of your cooking gas we are mixing this cooking gas with air air which is di directly present there is no any separate compressor is provided in the home okay the burner construction is in such a way that from the lower part of burner you may see some holes are provided that is for entry of the uh, air okay and the fuel gas is coming out through the nozzle okay many times you may have observed in the house also there is blackening of the utensils so your flame become being yellow and why this happens because there is more concentration of your fuel gas and less air is admixing or reaching towards the flame so that can be again corrected by cleaning the holes which are there in the back end of your burner that will allow the maximum air so in all cooking process you should have maximum air and minimum fuel gas so that you will get the blue flame it should not be yellow okay so proper temperature should be adjusted so second example you may have written the flame which is used in the welding you have seen the gas welding uh, stations okay so what they are using there is a small cylinder which is lying there and one vertical column is there so that column they utilizes um, certain stone like material okay what is that stone like material okay so just you uh, check it what it is by curiosity only you go to certain uh, uh, welders and you ask him what he is adding in the cylinder so he is adding something you should know what it is then he added the water it result into the formation of one gas okay so that is acetylene and the second is your oxygen cylinder it is using the oxygen uh, acetylene and oxygen combinations for welding purpose the temperature is very high okay so he can increase oxygen and that can be also used to cut the metals 
okay so that is due to the high temperature okay so this thing you may have seen in laboratory also you may have used the acetylene air admixture for sealing of the ampules glass ampules you can uh, seal this glass ampules using acetylene air mixtures okay so you just go to some uh, blowers glass blowers there also you can see the acetylene uh, air mixture they are using okay and you can see actual how this admixtures can be handled okay the last gas which you can use is your cyanogen the cyanogen it is a toxic gas it cannot be used with air it is generally uh, used with the uh, oxygen and it is giving very high temperature of 4580 and that is not generally handled in the simple uh, laboratories now the first component is your sample delivery system there are three components introducing the liquid samples one is your nebulizer it breaks up the liquid into the small droplets nebulizer there is small nozzle okay which will convert the liquid into the small droplet nebulizing uh, nebulizing is the conversion of sample into the mist mist uh, mist that is coke or small droplets or finely divided droplets into a jet or compressed gas by using this jet or compressed gas the flow car carries the sample into the atomization region okay so there is a creation of a small vacuum and that will result into the sucking of your liquid through this capillary okay so there is a formation of a negative pressure uh, due to the flow of your carrier gas and the fuel gas that will result into the small vacuum creation and that will suck the liquid from the beaker then there is a pneumatic uh, nebulizers okay so that is the most commonly used pneumatic that is a uh, um, by using the pressure pressure of uh, your fuel gas okay so the second one is your aerosol modifiers it removes large droplets there are baffles provided in the mixing chamber okay where the small droplets get adhered and they will come out as a exit or vent through the bottom of the uh, flame okay so they they are not allowed because they will change the total temperature of filament okay before they reach to the filament they have to be removed from the um, burner system okay so that is known uh, by providing certain baffles it removes large droplet from the stream and allow only smaller droplet than a uh, center size to pass okay then there is a flame or atomizer it converts the analyte into the free atoms okay so there is not a uh, certain devices used they are generally the flame itself only what are the various atomizer so uh, ideal characteristic include continuous atomization atomization that is not automatic okay don't think of confused with the automatic automatic is different atomizer okay atomization means converting into the small droplets so there are continuous atomization technique where the equal droplet size is produced and they, are, they should be producing the sturdy and easily cleanable because mostly during the atomization there are the chances that the, the nozzle will get clogged clogged means there is a blocking of this nozzle due to the falling of the dried particles and that should not be there atomizer system should be uh, in such a way that it should be cleaned easily so uh, the type of atomization system the either the sample is directly introduced uh, spray into the flame or which is introduced in the flame chamber of atomizer there is a mix chamber where the mixing will be there then it is allowed to enter into the um, uh, burner system okay so now uh, atomizer generally attached with the burner itself only so we we are having two types of the burner system one is called as a premix burner okay premix burner and another one is your total consumption burner the premix burner they are widely used because unif uh, uniformity in flame intensity in this energy type of the burner aspart sample fuel and oxidants are thoroughly mixed before reaching the burner operations okay so just pause the video and you think of what premix burner you are using in your day to day life please pause the video write your answers in notebook if you are finished 
play the video. Okay, tell me the examples where you are using the premix burner. In your kitchen, you may have Primax stoves. Okay, so that Primax is nothing but the premix burners. They are also utilizing the premix chambers where the fuel uh, get mixed with the air. Okay, and then the, it will be converted to the gases. Then it is coming out. Okay, so either we have premix uh, burners system or we have the premix lamp. That is Primax lamps which are used in the household system. Okay, so they are having a uh, premixing chamber. I will explain how it works. See here, uh, this is the Primax burner system. Uh, this is a premix chamber. This is provided with the mixing uh, blades. Okay, or this can act as a baffle also to take out the larger droplets. There is small capillary, and this is the nebulization system where a small nozzle is fixed. Okay, so when this air and fuel gas passes through this um, nozzle, they creates a vacuum here. And this vacuum will suck the liquid or sample. And when it comes out to, through this nozzle, it will be converted to the small droplets here. Then these small droplets are mixed with the gas, um, where fuel gas and your admixture gas, that is air. And this mixture is done by this rotating um, Plates, okay, or they can acting as baffles also, which will remove the larger particles and allow only the smaller particles to enter into this burner system. Okay, so there is a vent, so excess particles or larger particles will be taken out through this U tube, or it is called as a vent, and then it is wasted out, and only the smaller particles are allowed to enter into the flame. So they will directly come with the fuel and uh, your air. And will get burned in the flame okay so they uh, due to the thermal excitation here only in the flame so there is no sample holder separately the flame itself acting as a sample holder okay it will be having the many functions i will show you the functions later on so it will be converting liquid into the small droplets then this flame temperature will thermally excite it and then excited radiations will be filtered by this filter and they are detected amplified and recorded this is called as a premix burner Another one is your total consumption burner. The name itself gives their principle. See here, see here, total consumption burners. So there are two tubes. One tube is taking in the fuel inside and the inner tube is taking the uh, air or your uh, supporting gas inside. And the inner part of this burner system is provided with the capillary. Okay. So when these two gases moves or comes out through this part, so they will create a vacuum here. These vacuums will suck the liquid from which is present into the um, beaker. Okay, so this liquid will be sucked by capillary and this all come out through this nozzle. And directly uh, it will be uh, inserted into the flame. Therefore it is known as a total consumption burner. The larger particles uh, will be dropping down and they will be sent to the drain. Okay, so then again in the flame they will be thermally excited and then they are detected. So the basic disadvantage of your uh, total consumption burner is clogging of these nozzles. Separately, every time this nozzle will get clogging, clogged out because the particles, uh, the liquid when comes into the filament will be converted to the small particles. These particles will get again drop into the nozzles and they may block the um, nozzle part. Okay, so that required the continuous cleaning. So uh, today all instrument uses this premix burner system. Okay, so there are the two types of the burner systems. The next component is your monochromators and detectors. So we can have the prisms um, for the dispersion purpose. Quartz material is used for making the prisms as quartz is transparent over the entire region. It can be used for UV and visible region. Uh, we can have the gratings also in the monochromators for dispersion of radiation. It employs a grating which is essentially a series of parallel straight lines as we have learned in the previous chapters which cuts into the parallel surfaces. Angular dispersion will be there. Then this dispersed radiations of the appropriate wavelength. Either we can use the monochromators or we can have the simple filters. So the filters used in the flame photometer are interference filters. 
okay they are either using the absorption filters or interference filter interference filters are most commonly utilized okay so then there is a detector system either we can go for the uh, photomultiplier tubes or we can use the photo emissive cells or photovoltaic cell as your detector system the readout system which will convert the signal uh, light signal into the readable form okay so it cap it is capable of dispensing the absorption spectrum as well as the absorption uh, specific wavelengths nowadays the instrument has a microprocessor controlled electrons that provides output compatible with the printers and computers thereby minimizing the possibility of the operator errors in the transmitting the data now here we have completed all the instrumentation one more important topic that is interference in determining the amount of uh, a particular element present uh, other elements can also affect the results so it is called as a interference such interference may be spectral interference occur when the emission lines of two element cannot be resolved or arises from the background of the flame itself okay so if you are having the admixture of two or more metal ions they may produce the uh, interference with each other they are either two closers or overlap or occurs due to the high concentration of salt in the samples uh, as it is also a colorimetric measurement it also implies the bias lambert's law so when there is such an interference we can also think of the bias lambert's law by, for using the dilute solution so first is called as a spectral interference and second one when is a ionic interference where the high temperature flame may cause ionization of some of the metal example sodium okay this sodium ion possess an emission spectra of its own they will produce the yellow color flame with a frequency which are different from those of the atomic spectrum of the sodium atoms okay so maybe different colors will be produced okay so that we require this sodium ions to be separated out and the third one is your chemical interference the chemical interference arises out of the reaction between different interactions and the analyte includes okay it includes cation and anion interactions the presence of cation anion such as the oxalate phosphate sulfate in a solution may affect the intensity of radiation emitted by an element or cation cation inter interactions these interference are neither spectral nor ionic in nature For example aluminum interference with calcium and magnesium so these are the three types of interference we are generally occurring so we need to take certain care to avoid this interference either we can separate out the metals or we can develop a procedure in such a way that at a time one element will be detected then you change the filter the another element can be detected okay in uh, monochromatics we can change the wavelength by using monochromator devices okay so this is about the interference now applications flame photometer has both qualitative and quantitative applications okay mostly we are using uh, quantitative analysis in laboratory flame photometer with monochromators emit radiation of characteristic wavelength which helps to detect the presence of a particular metal in the sample estimate sodium potassium calcium lithium etc uh, level in sample of the serum urine csf and other body fluid uh, we are using this flame photometry sodium and potassium ions in muscles and heart can be determined by diluting the blood serum and aspiration into the flame it has advantages that it is simple quantitative analytical test based on the flame analysis it is inexpensive the determination of elements such as alkali and alkaline earth metal is preferred easily with most reliable and convenient methods it is quite quick uh, convenient and selective okay we can have selection in both the way uh, selection of ions and selection of filters 
it is sensitive means very less samples or very small quantity of the samples can be detected even to a parts per million or even to a parts per billion range can be detected so it is a simple sensitive technique but it has certain disadvantages that the concentration of metal ion in the solution cannot be measured accurately okay why it is not measured accurately the standard solution with known molarities is required for determining the concentration of ions which will corresponds to the emission spectra it is difficult to obtain accurate results of ions with the higher concentration as you consider the bs lambert's law uh, concentration deviation the information about the molecular structure of component present in sample solution cannot be determined cannot be obtained only the burning will result into the thermal excitation the elements such as carbon hydrogen and halides cannot be detected due to its non uh, radiating natures okay so they will not remit the radiations and they cannot be detected it has only limitations that it can be used to detect a very limited numbers of ions okay only sodium potassium calcium and lithium can be detected by using your simple flame photometer the rest of the element can be detected by using your atomic absorption spectroscopy we are going to learn this part into the next uh, lecture thank you thank you very much and have a happy learning see you in the next lecture